Hey guys, it's Roderick, and I'm here in a little movie corner for you. So, something happened last night that really kind of like made me want to come on and, and talk about it on a video. And, you know, I wanted to share when we have a discussion about it. So, last night I was watching Stepford Wives. I'm in the middle of like getting ready to start another script. And, you know, a lot of times I'll watch different movies just to kind of spur kind of like the imagination or my creative juices. If I have a problem that's going on in the back of my head, if I just watch something, usually I can figure it out. So I was like, well, let's watch Step for Wives. And, you know, it's a, I own the film on DVD. So I was like, let's put that in. So as I was watching the film this time, it occurred to me really how far ahead and ahead of its time Stepford Wise was, right? So if you've not watched Stepford Wise, just, just to let you know, I'm going to do some spoilers, okay? I'm also going to spoil Don't Worry Darling for you too, but if you have, you know, either one of those, anyway, here we go. So as I was watching Stepford, so first of all, Stepford Wives um, came out in 2004, starring Nicole Kidman, uh, Bette Midler, John Lovett, Matthew Broderick, Christopher Walken, Glenn Close, all-star cast, right? And the film really did not get uh, the rave reviews that I think the studios were hoping for, right? Now, The Stepford Wise that came out in 2004 is a remake of the 1975 edition. Now, the 1975 version was a lot darker. It was had a very horror twinge, and the ending was a lot different, which we'll get into in a second. But, you know, when they did the, the, the 2004 version that's done by Frank Oz, was a lot lighter, it had like a flair of camp to it, and was like fairly enjoyable. So as I was watching this, I was like, oh my God, this film was way ahead of its time. And I now understand why it got such bad reviews at the time, because a lot of people did not understand or did not think what the film was talking about could be really possible. So let's just get into it. First, so, you know, Stepford Wise was very portentous for a lot of reasons. First thing it did is that it gave rise in 2004 to the rise and kind of dominance of reality television. So this is how the film starts. Nicole Kidman plays Joanna Eberhardt, who is an executive at EBS, and she's doing the kind of, I forget that there's a name for it, but when the television shows talks to their affiliates about their upcoming slate of television shows, right? So what she has done is that she slated a bunch of reality television shows. The first one's called Balance of Power, hosted by Meredith Vieira, who makes a guest star appearance in this film. And it's about women competing against their husbands and showcasing how women are just as capable or more capable than their husbands. So there's a whole funny little scene about this husband and wife. And she's like, you know, who, who, who runs a triathlon? Bing, I do. Who wants me to date a hot lesbian? Bing, I do. So it's kind of like this film about, um, you know, this kind of reality show about women really rebalancing power in their relationships. The second show she does is called I Can Do Better. And she has Hank and Nora from um, Omaha. And she pretty much is like, and there's a part of the show this where they split the couple up. Hank spends a weekend with Nessa, who's an exotic dancer. And Nora spends a weekend with like the cast of a porn, the cast of uh, porn and then you know, this guy called Tunga Hero or whatever like that. And at the end of the teaser, we see that Nora decides that she doesn't want to go back with Hank. She wants to stick and hang out with the porn stars because she's like, before I met him, he was the only person I had sex with. But now I have only had sex with all these people and I like it and I can do better, right? And, you know, it, it, you know the audience gets great rave reviews. Everybody likes it until Hank shows up and blames Joanna Everhart for the demise of his marriage and tries to shoot her, right? So let's break this down. So first of all, in 2004, the writer's strike of 2008 had not occurred, right? So reality television shows were not that prevalent in the networks. They were kind of, you know, you had a little shows here and there. You still had the Real Housewives had been launched, but it was not such so prolific. You know, Discovery really, you know, wasn't really having their huge slate of, of Rather television shows, you had, you know, mob wives, loving, you know, um, basketball wives. But, you know, after the writer's strike in 2008, you know, networks really started increasing and boosting their cadre of reality television shows because those were the shows that they could, that did not require writers who were unionized. And they also had a really huge profit margin at that time, right? So if a television show costs, let's say, $10 million, $7 million to make per season, right? 
you could do a reality television show for probably a million dollars and still net about this above you know equal or greater profits with your advertising right so that's kind of what happened and so in 2004 to have a film about a network kind of in you know increasing and robusting um their slate of shows including all reality television shows was really ahead of its time and i don't think people watching it at that time really thought that was something possible fast forward 19 years later and that's pretty much all you that with a large part of television shows like nbc universal has bravo hbo has discovery plus or discovery plus has hbo which is a bunch of reality television shows you know, Peacock, like, so there's, you know, even Netflix has their own reality television slate. So at that time, no one really thought that television could really be, um, you know, the reality of television could be a large part of television. So now we move to the next port to this part, right? So the inciting incident in this film, and that the inciting incident is the incident that moves our protagonists to their call of duty or whatever is when Hank tries to kill Joanna Everhart, right? Because then after her, the, the guy tries to shoot her, she gets fired from her job and has this complete emotional breakdown and then has to move to Stepford with her husband, Matthew Broderick, as a way to kind of recoup and get away because he's quit his job at the network too. So the first thing that kind of looking at this now, you know, through this film, through the lens is, is how bullshit it was for Hank to blame Joanna Eberhardt for the demise of his marriage when the person you should have blamed was your wife. Mind you, in the film, he put the wife and Tung Hero in the hospital because he went and decided to shoot her, right? So we kind of saw at first, I was like, interesting. This man is really blaming the woman for his own failings in his own marriage and not really thinking and looking to himself. But we kind of dismissed that because you're like tongue in cheek. So when Joanna and her husband Walter get to Stepford, they're greeted by Glenn Close, who's this realtor who shows them this kind of picturesque society, this huge house, whatever. Joanna's still doped up on her drugs. And Joanna's journey through the film is her kind of navigating this community of, step of, of women in Stepford who are all blonde, who are all white, who are all homemakers, who are all sexy, and they're all married to these mediocre, dud, dopey women, right? Dopey men, right? And then, and then, of course, she, you know, um, Bette Midler's character, Bobby, shows up, who is this uh, really kind of out there, avant-garde um, author. Um, she gets, um, there's another gay character that, that shows up. And those are kind of like the three triads that's there. Christopher Walken appears um, later in the film as the husband of Glenn Close's character. And he's kind of the man that all the men look up to. And there's a scene in which Faith Hill, who's playing one of the Stepford Wives, you know, starts acting really weird. And, you know, Joanna Eberhardt's like, she needs a doctor. She needs, you know, she needs help. And we see all these men ignore her and listen to the man. So I'm looking at this film and I'm thinking to myself, this is how life works, right? There is nothing, you have all these men not listening to this woman about what's going on in this woman's, in this, with this problem with this woman, but they're gonna listen to this man. And then I realized that this film was really, really not necessarily about the horror, but about really the way in which men disregard and treat and think of women in their lives, right? Because the spoiler is, what's happening at Stepford is that the men are traveling to Stepford these men are married to high power women who are CEOs, judges, authors, the gay couple, he wants an architect, and they don't like the fact that their women outshine them. They don't like the fact that their women outperform them. They don't like the fact that they feel secondary. So instead of them stepping their lives up, right, or making themselves better, the solution is, is to make these women into robots whose sole purpose is to serve them. They can, mod they can modify their breasts. They, the women can pop out money out their mouths. They are sex kittens. They are there to serve the men. And I was like, wow, this is such a commentary on how men, really straight men, think and view about the women in their lives. But in 2004, right, it's, it doesn't connect with the audience because you're thinking men don't think like that. 
That would never happen. We don't live in a society where men out overtly have such animus for the lives and bodies and respects of women. Fast forward to 19 years later, and Stepford Wise hits a lot differently, right? So then we get into the fact that ultimately Joanna, and Joanna decides that, you know, she's gonna become a robot because Walter pretty much is like, you know what, this is it. Long story short, she doesn't. And Mike, who's the main figure that everyone looks up to, was a robot who was created by Glenn Close. So this white lady created this world for other white women. Because mind you, there are no black, there was like maybe one black person in Stepford, right? So the, this white woman creates this world for other women to live in so that women can feel cherished and taken care of and men can be men and women could be women. And this is the view of the world that she lived in. And I was like, oh my God, it's like 2016 all over again with the 53% of white women who voted for Trump, right? And these kind of like the whole concept of being your proximity to male hegemonic power, right? Now, if you haven't seen Don't Worry Darling, I'm about to ruin it for you, right? Because Don't Worry Darling is a knockoff of Stepford. It's not it's literally Stepford Wives, just updated, right? Probably a little bit more picturesque. Olivia Wilde does an excellent job directing, but it's Stepford Wives. Same concept, same thing. Chris Pine, Christopher Walken, whole same, same fucking story, right? Just not as... I, I, not as nuanced, right? Because then looking at Step for Wives now, you realize that there's a lot of nuance to this film. The fact of how resentful the men feel about dating their powerful wives. Because there's a whole scene when Matthew Broderick is like, we married Wonder Women. We married Amazon Queens. What does that make us? Nicole Goodman's like, lucky, cherished, valuable. No, we were the wuss. We got to hold your purse. I got to tell the kids you weren't coming home. And I was like, well, wait a minute. If the roles were reversed and the women are doing this, you would think this would be completely fine. And I'm just looking, and, but the truth is, there are a lot of men now in 2013, as they were in 2004, who really thought that this was acceptable. And as we look at society and look at how the loss of female reproductive rights of really kind of, you know, the number one killer of women is men. Right? So in thinking about that, I was like, oh my God, this film was so far ahead of its time in talking about the dynamics between men and women and really kind of how our society is kind of lurching towards this, you know, this faux paradise of kind of men being men, women being women. You it comes up in these discussions, these like very false up to discussions about bathrooms and, and trans rights and whatever. And I was like, I really hate I didn't appreciate this film when it first came out. But I also realized that not enough things had happened in 2004 for you to really appreciate this film for what it is. Is it campy? Yes. Is it kind of lighthearted? Yes. But it's also very salient. A lot of the characters you see in this film you're like, oh, I know somebody like that. Oh, I like somebody like that. The gay couple where one turned, where one became a gay Republican, right? So the, I, I, I urge to go back and look at Stepford Wives through the 2023 lens. It really hits differently when you watch the when you watch the film and you think about a lot of the ways in which society has lurched from 2004 to 2023, right? And you get really get the sense of thinking like, obviously no one thinks that it would be possible that men would want to replace women with robots that totally serve them. Who knows, right? But it is a very interesting concept and it does really hit differently when I was watching it. So anyway, that Stepford Wives, it, I mean, I think that it was very much ahead of its time in talking about really the socio- um, the sociological dynamics of men and women in America and really how people could not appreciate it because they really did not think that A, that was possible or that men really thought that way. And now in 2023, we now see that men really do think, men really do think that way. And if you can, and I wonder if you had a blind poll, would a man, a man had the option, straight men had the option to replace their wives with a robot 
that was totally subservient, that was really hot, that wanted to have sex on demand, that just popped out money out their mouth, that didn't really talk, that didn't have an opinion, how many men would really go for that option? Right? So anyway, go, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's available streaming. If you, if, I, you know, if you own a DVD, that's even better. Go back, watch Debt for Wives, and let me know what you guys think. Because I think, I, well, I think there's an interesting discussion about it. So anyway, don't forget to like, don't forget to comment, don't forget to check out some of my other videos, subscribe, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.